Hey guys, Richard Older here. Welcome to the channel. Sorry about the echo, but we're in the dinosaur where all the fun stuff happens. Here's the question for today. What happens when you super cool your fuel? We're gonna get things started by taking a look at the change in fuel temperature through running through my cooling unit that I made. And what I did was we ran the fuel the way that we normally do. We have a deadheaded system. We've got an air motor fuel pump, the air motor regulator, and then it goes up and deadheads basically into the factory fuel rail run on this GT40 equipped 302. And obviously I went through a description on the whole motor and everything before this, but you can see we're running the deadheaded system. And what I did was we monitored fuel temperature going into the rail. So we wanted to see what temperature was before we put the cooler on it and running no cooler the way that we normally run these on the dyno the fuel temperature was about 91 to 92 degrees is what we see here i know we see what looks like a big spike but the scale on this thing right now is only one degrees or 1.25 degrees so we'll see when this will flatten out and essentially be nothing it will be perfectly flat when we put the other version up here where we ran it through the fuel cooler and so the fuel cooler basically was something that I borrowed from my buddy Mark Sanchez. It basically is just an oil cooler because obviously it will work with the kind of pressures that we're running in the fuel. And so we're running our air motor pump into the regulator. And then what I did was the fuel coming out of the regulator, we ran through this oil cooler essentially. And I took the oil cooler and stuffed it down into a five gallon bucket chock full of frosty cold ice water so that cooled the fuel off quite a bit and we monitored the temperature of the fuel coming out of the cooler between the cooler and the fuel rail and you can feel that the temperature of the fuel was down dramatically because it would cool off the fuel rail so the fuel rail actually would be cold to the touch when we were when we were running this thing so run the way that we normally run it uh, on the dyno our fuel temperature going into the rail was about 91 to 92 degrees and here's what happened when we ran it through the cooler, you can see uh, dramatically lower. In fact, running it through the 32 degree transfer medium with the oil cooler, we got the fuel temperature down as low as 44 degrees. So it was a it was a pretty big change. You're talking about you know nearly 50 degrees of temperature change here, which is quite a bit. And you, so you can see now what I was talking about that the fuel temperature before, basically a flat line varying by only one degree. And then the fuel temperature actually dropped um, as we were running this and then and then rose up a little bit right at the end. But we had very, very cold fuel temperature and this was a big change. Now, one of the things I have to uh, point out here is that fuel temperature in the car actually would be quite a bit hotter than this because we're not compressing the fuel it's a liquid so we're not getting it's not like boost it's not like we have you know 45 or 50 or 60 pounds of boost it's just so we're not compressing it but you do get a lot more fuel temperature from the way that we run the system so we're running the fuel obviously through the engine compartment which is very hot it's hot outside we get radiant heat from the ground up so the temperature of the fuel in your fuel tank, especially on a hot summer day, is probably going to be a lot hotter than this. So if we were able to cool it down, the delta change would be even more dramatic than this. But now let's take a look and see what kind of power change we got from this temperature change. Naturally, I was very excited about the change in fuel temperature and that my rigged up system using the oil cooler from Mark Sanchez and the simple bucket of ice water had that much of an effect on the fuel cooling. I, I like the fact that we dropped it by, you know, 45 or 50 degrees. And so that was a significant change. Like I said, it would be even more, if it would be even hotter in the car, and I still think we could bring it down fairly cool, 
even if I had to bring, if we could get the fuel temperature up to 120 or 130 or 140 degrees, which I think is easily possible the way that it's running around in the car, and then we could run two of these systems, run two buckets of ice and two coolers and, and get the fuel temperature down so we could get a, a, a bigger change. I was hoping for some fairly big power numbers. What the thing that I was hoping for when I did this test going into it, I thought, okay, this is going to be very cool. We're going to get more charge cooling, which is going to be beneficial. You know, we're going to make more power. This will be like running. I was hoping that it would be kind of the equivalent of running uh, a difference when we run E85. So maybe, maybe I'm going to need to redo this test on a supercharged application where we have more temperature and maybe we could use the cooler fuel to make more of a change in charge temperature because run naturally aspirated, it did what things do when, um, it made basically no difference. It did what things do when I run this kind of test with the 85 on a naturally aspirated motor like this. I don't normally see a big change in power when I run E85 on a fairly mild NA motor that doesn't have very, very high compression, isn't running on the limit of a knock sensor like a, even like a Coyote or a, a direct injected, um, LT motor or any kind of boosted motor. Every time I run E85 on a boosted motor, whether it's through carburetors on top of a, a 671 or 871 blower, whether it's blowing through with a twin screw or a roots blower or a centrifugal blower or turbos or anything, whatever I put that on, on any kind of boosted application, whenever I run E85, we see a fairly significant change in power. And that's really what I was hoping for here when I did this fuel cooling, especially after seeing the, all the work that uh, Freiburg and Dulcich and Brule did on engine masters with changing the fuel temperature and cooling things off, the carburetor, the intake manifold, all of that. Seeing that the gains that they got from the carbureted combinations, I was hoping that we would see even more from this fuel injected version because we have such high fuel pressure. You know, we're compressing the fuel. We're not actually compressing the fuel. But I was hoping for a big change, but we really didn't see it. I mean, we're seeing a little bit of wiggling here and there, but we saw that kind of thing from variations in run to run. And we just didn't see the kind of railroad track gains that I thought we would from getting maybe that significant change in fuel temperature. But let me know in the comments. Let me know what you guys think. Should I duplicate this test and see if there might be more of a difference, like on a force induction application, maybe with a centrifugal blower, like a torque storm, or maybe with a turbo on it, where we have more charge temperature? Or maybe should I move these, <laughs> in this case, the injectors, um, higher up in the fuel, I mean, in the intake ports to see if we get more charge cooling and more time for charge cooling. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Let's get to our conclusion. Okay, guys, it's that time again. What do we learn from our video on our test running and cooling the fuel on our fuel injected modified 302 Ford motor? Well, this test was actually a little disappointing for me. I had really high hopes for that, and I'll tell you why. There are really three reasons why I had high hopes for this. Based on the testing that the guys from Engine Masters did, Brule and Dulcich and, and Freiburger, when they did testing on cooling the fuel for their carbureted applications, they actually saw a power gain. And I've seen this in the past with cool cans. And also, I know from personal experience, cooling the fuel on our big block Chevy, the 454, that we had the carbureted combination, cooling the fuel, at the very least, cured vapor locks. So we knew it was good for that. But I also expected power gains from cooling the fuel on this application. The other thing is, if we take a look at the testing that I've done on E85, we know running, switching over from, you know, normal gasoline, even if it's race gas, to E85, we always see a change in power. And part of that is from the cooling effect offered by E85. So I thought that kind of lends itself to thinking, yes, this is going to happen. And the final thing is that I've done lots and lots of testing on different injector positions. Now, we know that we see power gains from carbureted applications because of the charge cooling that's associated with introducing the fuel basically right at the common plenum on these carbureted manifolds. And it has time for cooling to take place before it gets down to the port. When we inject fuel, uh, an injector right at the port, there's less time for that charge cooling to take place, which is why carburetors usually do fairly well when we're comparing them. But I have on a number of occasions, on a number of different engine families, also moved the injector from its position right at the port, right kind of where the intake manifold meets the cylinder head. We've moved that 
farther away from the port. And the farther away we move it from the port, we usually get gains in power because what happens is there's more time for charge cooling to take place, just like with the carburetor, because the fuel is introduced farther away from the valve. So when we move the injector position, there's more time for this cooling effect to take place. So I thought, well, it stands as a reason then that there's more time there. And if we cool the fuel, the same kind of thing should happen. But unfortunately, we didn't see that. So that begs the question, should I revisit this on a boosted application? Should I maybe try a different kind of fuel? Let me know in the comments what you think I should do. I'm Richard Holder. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. I'll keep testing.